Hello everyone, uh, I hope you are all safe and uh, <coughs> feeling okay. Uh, I'm Pierre Souchet, uh, working for Criteo, where I'm leading a discovery team, the team which is responsible for developing SDKs for various applications, as well as operating console. We are also some very heavy uh, contributors to uh, open source console with more than 120 uh, pull request merge in uh, console. And we are also uh, contributing to open source through two projects, HAProxy Console Connect, which is an implementation of Console Connect with HAProxy. And we are also the author of uh, Console Template RB, a tool that allows you to create uh, fancy UIs uh, based on console data. We'll see a bit this product in action later in this presentation. So today, we are going to see how we operate a uh, console at our large scale. We are using lots of machines, lots of uh, humans, and uh, lots of infrastructure. So we are going to see how we deal with all those aspects. Because dealing with humans is as important as dealing with uh, servers or applications. Uh, the world is changing very, very fast today. We are moving from machines to services in VM, to containers, to function as a service. We are using several clusters several cloud providers. We've got a huge multiplication of microservices those last years. And we start using service mesh as well to handle east-west traffic in our data center. So infrastructure is changing everything. And it's very hard to discover where the things actually are. And Consul helps a lot with that. That's this exact reason why my company, Criteo, which is a major advertiser with many servers displaying ads on the internet, starting using console in 2015. At that time, we had around 15,000 servers. We are something like 40,000 now. And console helped us a lot to move from, mesh, from service on machine to pure service architectures. So we use now console everywhere. It's a real backbone for our, for our company. So let's start with the most, uh, one of the biggest issues we had while ma migrating to console, which was humans. In our, in our company, we've got more than 2,500 people and around 500 regular uh, humans using our services directly. Those, those people are working in the R&D when, when I'm working as well. And they, those, those people want to know what is happening to their application how to call this particular microservice API, um, or other questions such as what happened last night, or how do I create a new service? When we started using console, we had lots of those questions every day, and it was, we were spending, my team and I, all our time answering to those questions. So our first move was to really give those humans ways to know what is happening on their systems. So, our first action was to create an UI called Consul UI. So it's based on Consul Template RB. It's an open source project. And it's a UI you can plug in your organization. It shows live information about Consul. It is displayed, uh, it is displayed using a simple static web server. So you can scale it for thousands of users if you need to. It can very easily allow you to plug links to your systems in your organization. It shows uh, easily metadata semantic and it's open source. So you can tune it, you can change it to fit your exact needs. So now we are going to see this in action. So in this small video, what we are seeing is uh, this UI in real time. Uh, where I'm, I'm using it to find some services just by typing a few words of the service. I can also use tags, which is a feature using console to filter uh, systems. So here yeah, I'm filtering on FTP, but I can also use some global tags such as HTTP, who is talking HTTP or is, who is using Swagger. Swagger is a me mechanism to describe web services. So here I'm gonna find all the Swagger systems and I'm gonna display it right here. And then from this UI on the right side, I'm able to display the Swagger descriptor and directly call my APIs. All the data you are seeing here is called metadata. It's not only data that is visible, it's data that is useful because it's used by other systems as well 
to take decisions about how to provision infrastructure, for instance. So this UI reflects exactly what is provisioned in con with console and is, dis and is uh, updated live. The good thing about that is every link you are seeing here is a simple JavaScript stuff, so you can very easily tune it for your organization and link it to your systems. I've shown here, I'm currently showing uh, how we, we can inspect the machine the service is running on, for instance, with this hardware and so on. But we are creating links, for instance, to our alerting system, so we can see uh, how the alerts are configured for this system. We can see how the load balancer are configured for these systems, or simply see the change log for this version. So it's very, very useful and it's very easy to tune, meaning that you can link console to all the other system in your infrastructure. And it's very important for us because it's allow users without specific knowledge about console to reach all of our systems and to get specific information for their services. So it's very, very useful. And uh, the other very interesting feature here is everything is very, very fast. So you can, you can uh, search for any kind of data very, very quickly and reach them uh, in a matter of seconds. Another very interesting feature is our users wanted to know what happened in the past. So here I'm currently seeing how a timeline is able to display what happened to your service last night, for instance, and users are able to investigate. It's a very important feature because in the last, in the early days, we were constantly asked, what happened to my service last night? And having this feature bundled in this console UI allow people to investigate by themselves what is happening to their services and uh, to be completely autonomous about how uh, the um, how they uh, during incident, for instance. So it's very very useful. Another very interesting feature here is we mark owners, so it's possible to identify for each of the services of Criteo the real owners, so the team which is handling this service. And it's very useful in case of incident, but it also be used by other applications to take decisions. So another key point we learned with uh, scaling with our users is to, to protect the users from themselves. Users, you don't want uh, your user to be able to perform modification even on the other services. You want everything to be standardized. So all of our services in our systems uh, start with some declarative information in their console services and only at startup this data can be, uh, can be changed. It cannot be changed later, so people cannot add entropy into your system. Another uh, <coughs> very important stuff is the data registered in console can be changed only by the machine itself. We are having lots of machines and protecting uh, others to modify the uh, service on a given machine is very important because it ensures that nobody did change what is published into console. And finally, as I said, owners are a key point for us because we, we've got more than 4,000 kind of different services. So identifying the stakeholders is very important in case of emergency, but it can also leverage lots of lo uh, other uh, kind of usage, such as consumption of resources and so on and so on. So what did we learn? We learned that in order to scale with our users, being open is very helpful because giving them UI to be able to investigate, avoid the need for operators to answer lots of questions. And we went from having uh, thousands of questions per day to have maybe one question per week. So it's, it allows a small team such as ours, which is only uh, four people, to answer to the needs of our 500 users. And we did also a huge uh, effort into standardization of naming and metadata. So we prefix all uh, services with the team name, for instance. So it allows us to really uh, build experience of uh, users, so users can help themselves as well. So another key thing we learn is people love their service. They want configuration put in right into their system. So that's why we use 
a feature we develop, uh, which is called service metadata, which allows to embed metadata into the service. And this service, this metadata will allow to configure external systems. They want predictability, so give them the ability to, ex to explore what is happening to their system, give them the tools to investigate themselves, and they love business semantics. Whenever you are putting metadata, don't put metadata related to tools. Don't configure the alerting system of the moment. Put business semantics. Uh, and it's very important because that's the way the infrastructure will be able to evolve on the long term. And another interesting uh, thing is uh, people want things to be magic. So by putting all the configuration of other systems into the service themselves, they don't have to call uh, yet another API to provision uh, <coughs> network, for instance, or to, uh, to add alerts. They can do all in one place. That's very important because in the same way, it allows us to uh, change our infrastructure systems without users notifying, since we define business semantics. Let's talk about uh, the applications. Uh, an application uh, usually wants to know where is his database, where is his Kafka, where is his NoSQL, where it can send metrics. An, an application could also uh, be using uh, other microservices. So where are my um, microservices? Where can I load balance the data to, this, uh, to those services? An application may be also uh, <clears throat> able to tell, oh, I'm feeling uh, too loaded. Uh, please send me less traffic. And finally, an application want to describe its metrics in order to, uh, to give information about its health stages. So, uh, in our case, we've got more than 4,000 dif uh, different kind of applications. That's around 400,000 uh, 400, uh, instances. And we've got some of these services are very, very, very large. Something like 2,000 uh, 2, instances on a single data center. So the first thing you have to do, to do very, very carefully is uh, to control specifically how people use your SDK. In our case, we've chosen to implement ourselves our SDK and to implement same defaults. We'll see a bit later about that. So the first very important thing to understand is use stale in all your queries. It's very important because whenever you are not using this parameter, whenever you are performing a request to console, all the requests will end on a given leader. So one single, even if you provision three, five or seven servers, all the requests will end up on a single server. Stell allow console to answer from any of those servers. So it basically means that it allows horizontal scalability. If you want to scale your applications on your infrastructure, you need to use Stell everywhere. So it's very good when you, uh, you have control over your SDK, but sometimes you don't control your SDK. For instance, you are using external applications. We added support for uh, a feature in a console, which is called Discovery Maxtel. This feature allows you to uh, fall back by default on a stale requests for all applications. Meaning that if application don't specify, I want something consistent, they will use stale requests and so every console server will be able to serve them the data instead of just one machine in one place. And finally, whenever you are using a large infrastructure, uh, be sure to retry in case of errors with an exponential backoff in order to avoid to overload your console servers. So a typical application at Criteo is composed of a my app application, which is serving content from the internet. This application is using metrics, is using Kafka, is using microservices, is microservices using HTTP or gRPC, is using SQL Server, uh, catches, and so on and so on. What we did first is all those services are very different. For instance, we've got hundreds of databases, but they speak the same common language. So what we did was 
to build APIs for those common services. We've got an API to call to database, an API to call to messaging system, to metrics, an API to create a load balancer to HTTP, and so on and so on. Having this allowed to uh, really do a factorization of this code and to be able to control the behavior of these various SDKs and is really helpful on the long term. For instance, for a database, you, you may want to stick to a single instance, while for HTTP load balancing, you want to run Robin your calls or use Aperture or whatever. But it's very important because those kind of services has, have very different technical uh, requirements. So implementing this in one place allows you to control how your people will use the console APIs. Finally, an application, uh, it would be very helpful if an application could, uh, whenever it's too loaded, say, please stop sending me too much traffic. And console allows you from, from the ground. In a health check, uh, console supports three kinds of health check, uh, three states, passing, warning, and critical. We added support for changing the weight of requests whenever you are receiving, uh, when you, whenever you, the state of your application is in warning and passing. That's very important because it allows us to dynamically, when an application is overloaded, the application is just going to tell console, I'm too loaded, I'm in warning state, and then all the application targeting this, this uh, specific instance will send this uh, instance less traffic because it's in warning state. So it allows us to have a natural way of uh, letting the application to recover from excessive load. Excessive load. So it's, uh, it's very useful at large scale because you don't want one application to go down because as soon as one instance is down, Another instance will get done, another instance will get done, and so on, whenever you've got too much traffic. So it's very important as well. Okay, let's see a bit what we are doing on the infrastructure side. On the infrastructure side, we are using console everywhere as well. We are using it for load balancer, for metric, for alerting, for L availability, and we'll see a bit how we configure DNS as well. One of the key points we learned is technology in, in, on the infrastructure side is changing quite a lot. So we wanted to decouple producer from consumer. We call this inversion of control. And basically it works with some provisioner. Here I represented three provisioner, a Swagger catalog, an auto alerting system on a VAS, a VIP as a service. So basically something provisioning load balancers. And those systems are watching console services all the time and reflecting the changes uh, of those instances on performing provisioning uh, stuff. That's exactly all how our load balancers are working. Whenever an application is registered in console, console get notifies. It notifies the um, VIP as a service get notifies, create the entry in the load balancer, route traffic to it. And whenever the instances on this service are changing, uh, console is once again notifying the VAS and everything is modified dynamically. So it means that console is the only repository for all of our infrastructure. The load balancer are using it, but all of our libraries are using it whenever it is for, to discover databases, logs, or perform uh, HTTP uh, load balancing towards microservices. So it's, it's, it's a clear view, an unified view for all of our infrastructure on, on all of our applications. We are also in the in the uh, <coughs> in the demo of Console UI. I'll show you some uh, metadata, and this metadata is used by other systems, such as the automatic pro, uh, automatic alerting system. So it basically scrap everything which is uh, in the metadata of the service and can take decision, create alerts automatically, and uh, notify the owner of the service whenever the service is down. So we've got several of those services that are all using those same business semantics to build services over services. So that's very interesting because it completely changed the way we interact with our infrastructure. People don't have to feed yet another Git repository. They can change by themselves 
The metadata in their service and the infrastructure will take care of everything. Everything is magic because you're just publishing your service and the infrastructure will watch what's, what is published in your service and will take the appropriate decision. That's the way we, we can cover all the services we have. All the 4,000 services are covered with alerting if we want. So that's very, very powerful on the uh, infrastructure side. And finally, uh, I'll send you, uh, there's a small link in this presentation, but uh, let's see a bit how we are tuning our infrastructure. DNS is a complex piece of this because by default on console, a DNS will uh, reach the console server. So it's very important to use style queries, as I said previously. But you can also use catch queries we implemented into console to have sub-millisecond queries. So you've got almost instant query because all the, the queries to DNS are locally catched by the agent and do not require a call to the console server. You also have to, to take care with con uh, DNS configuration, especially negative TTL configuration. This is support we added as well. And uh, all of this allow you to have very, very good performance of DNS with console, but it requires some work. We have written an article about that. I uh, encourage you to, to have a look. Another key point regarding uh, large-scale infrastructure is whenever you are using several data centers, you might want to use async refresh of SCL over one. This is uh, support I added in, uh, <coughs> in a whole version of console, but uh, it's not the default. And it allows you, uh, whenever your link between your data center are weak, to still have very, very good performance. So use async cache for SEL DOM policy. Of course, take care of the ARP cache, ARP cache. Uh, if you are using large data center, you might be, uh, be hit by that. And finally, if you have a large infrastructure, uh, be strong on security. Enforce uh, the, uh, the write on the console agent only from the local machine and ensure that your script cannot be uh, registered uh, some um, health check cannot be a uh, health check script cannot be re registered using API calls. So to conclude, the more important thing we learned is for humans, applications and infrastructure define clear SLA. You have to define with all the stakeholders what does matter to console. For us, we choose to uh, select a few metrics those metrics are not technical metrics, it's business metrics. It's how much time do I need to register a service? How much time do I need to be sure that my key can be seen by all console agents in my data center? How much time uh, do I need to answer to, uh, to DNS? And so on and so on. So we define those SLAs. We are measuring it outside of console with small application. And we have a dashboard and on this, is, on this dashboard, everything is green where we are under the SLA, while it's orange where we are close and it's red when we are over. Doing this reduces quite a lot the amount of questions as well and people know exactly what we are engaging uh, with them, uh, how we, uh, <coughs> how we uh, of what we agree with them. So that's all for today. Uh, I will encourage you to have a look to uh, Console UI. Uh, so it's called the Console Template uh, RB. It's open source. You can fork it, you can patch it, you can send a pull request. And uh, we are also uh, doing lots of uh, articles on the Criteo R&D blog. So you can, uh, for instance, uh, Google, Bing, or DuckDuckGo, uh, configure Console for performance at scale, be a good Console client, or inversion of control for the infrastructure with Console. Thank you very much and uh, stay safe. Goodbye.